Oh, look at you. The brave hearted, knowledge questing superstars of ACSM Health and Fitness. Here you are. Oh, yeah, we're ready. We're going to hit it. You are the best. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Extreme Sports Hot Topics Panel. We have got a lot for you tonight. I'm going to introduce my incredible colleagues right now, Dixie Stanforth. And Dixie is a senior lecturer, provost teaching fellow at the University of Texas, Austin. Tremendous teaching university, and of course, tremendous research university. Dixie has helped bridge the gap between science and practice in the fitness industry through her published research for the last 25 years, or longer, or longer. Dr. Steve Blevin, Assistant Professor in the Uniformed Services University for the Health Sciences School of Medicine. And this is just one bullet of about 55. This is just one bullet of about 55. Dr. Blevin served as the sports medicine consultant to the Navy Surgeon General from 2011 to 2014. And Len Kravitz, Associate Professor of Exercise Science at the University of New Mexico. My research and writing interests are without a doubt towards the advancement and growth of the fitness industry. And of course, the most important panelists tonight are out in the audience because you're gonna drive this, this panel after we do our, our formalities, which will be about 30 minutes of education. I'd like to start it off with what is extreme sport? What is an extreme sport? I went to Wikipedia, and it's a kind of great, great definition, extreme sports. They're also called sports and adventure sports, but they define it as a popular term for certain activities that involve speed, height, a high level of physical exertion, and highly specialized gear. And Dixie, Steve, and I decided tonight, our, our focus is endurance and ultra-endurance. Because as Steve's going to share with us, you know, th there's a lot more similar than apart. But there are some really unique things that Dixie's going to introduce to us that we're not all aware. And so we did a little research on this. And the historical roots of ultra-endurance are perhaps best explained and described by Dr. Timothy Noakes in The Limits of Endurance Exercise in this article in Basic Research in Cardiology. And Dr. Noakes notes that in 1861, this handsome American Edward Weston walked 713 kilometers from Boston to Washington, D.C. to attend the inauguration of President Lincoln. Can you believe that? Incredible. And Noakes continues that Weston in the 1870s inspired the arrival of the six-day pedestrian walks. Competitors walked and jogged as far as they could for six straight days in these tiny, tiny areas. And New York City had a lot of walkers, and so did London. And it was very, very competitive between the London walkers and the New York City walkers. Here you see Edwin Weston. Everyone, he's in second place right now. Here you see he's in second place racing. And the winner of this race is Dan O'Leary. And I just love it. Look, look at this walking style. Everyone. Look, look at him there. Look at that lean back. That's got to be some kind of wind resistance factor there. But O'Leary covered... 837 kilometers in six days. And here's, it's called the Astley Belt Race held at Madison Square Gardens. 1879, here it is, Englishman Charles Roel. He's shown, he's leading the race, one with a distance of 800 kilometers. His winning purse, $20,398. Hey, 1879, we'll take it, we'll take it, we'll take it. 
Many of you know the very famous paleoanthropologist from Harvard University, Dr. Dan Lieberman, notes that most of us walk 2.9 miles per hour for men and women, and you know why we walk that way. He notes that when you walk about that speed, you're using the least amount of energy. We're very energy efficient creatures. And humans are the only primates, mammals that include monkeys, apes, and, and humans, capable of doing endurance running. Continuing with Dr. Lieberman, the collagen-enriched tendons and ligaments in the legs release a generous amount of stored energy during the propulsive phase of running. You're not going to believe this. This mechanism at the knee and ankle in running is estimated to save approximately 50% of the metabolic cost of running. Incredible. And going back to Noakes, the distances that humans are able to run fall just short to that of the Alaskan Husky. Right from the article, a quote from Timothy Noakes, humans evolved as endurance animals. What happened to us? 99% <laughs> of our population are sedentary couch potatoes, but we are made to be endurance animals. And here's Dan Lieberman talking about particularly elite athletes who, as we all know genetically, have much greater percent of slow contracting, oxidative and fatigue resistant muscle fibers in the primary muscles of the leg. And now you're seeing the finish line, 2005 women's world champion. Look at Marie de Baba. Look at this kick. This is the end of the race. Look at that. Is that incredible? Unbelievable athleticism. So here's a summary of several sources that Tony did the first author on an article. So th this, this is what Tom, Tony's research all introduced. He summarized this. Durable skeletons design favoring running at moderate intensities over long distances. This is why we're so capable of endurance performance. The effective ability to increase speed during running by just increasing stride length. Very, very effective mechanical advantage. As we just talked about, those slow twitch oxidative fatigue resistant muscle fibers, not in everyone, it varies a lot, but usually in the elite athletes. From training, everyone knows the enlarged left and right ventricular volume and wall thickness contributing to a tremendous increase in cardiovascular performance. And we develop these tremendous antioxidants that defend and protect the heart just in our consistent regular training. We have that unique ability of the muscles and tendons, as Lieberman said, to economically store and release energy as we need it in running. And lastly, thermoregulation. We are animals that can dissipate heat extremely effective, which allows us to go for many, many, many long endurance days, such as the pedestrian races, six days continuous. And so, it seems almost perfect to talk about what's happening right now today. And Tony, who did the article on that research, is an endurance athlete. And I'm going to ask him to share with us just what's happening now. Thank you, Dr. Kravitz, and thank you all for being here with our uh, panel for the extreme sports today. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as calling myself too much of an endurance athlete anymore, but I used to be at some time, as uh, Dr. Kravitz keeps me busy in the lab and writing. <laughs> but uh, let's talk about some extreme sport competitions that we see today that have really evolved uh, since competitions have been performed back in the late 1800s. So the Tough Mudder, one of the more popular races in the United States and probably the most popular race in the United States to date, it's a 10 to 12 mile course with mixed obstacles. And a lot of these events you'll notice are fundraisers for nonprofit organizations. This particular event is a fundraiser for the Wounded Warriors Project, which is great. This is a great uh, nonprofit organization. And they consider this event a challenge, not a race, because they really want you to finish, but they're not worried about how long it takes you to finish, okay? They really want you to build camaraderie and really help your participants next to you complete the race just as quickly as you do. 
as we said before, there are integrated obstacles, and in this video that we have here, you'll see a lot of these integrated obstacles into the 10 to 12 mile course. So you're running through water, you're climbing through high bars, you're under barbed wire, you're making sure you're in crawl zones in the mud, and as you can see, jumping off high walls in the water, and great camaraderie building. All these individuals are doing this together. Okay, as a team, making sure that everyone gets through the course and climbing up these 10 to 12, maybe even 14 foot walls and jumping, hoping that the water is deep enough to, so that you don't hit the ground. And then you have the electric fields that you're running through during the Tough Mudder, which is unique to this event. Now the Warrior Dash, another great event, one of the most popular races worldwide and you'll notice it's only been around since 2009, and we're in 2016 here. Seven years these events have only been around at most. So one of the most popular races worldwide, it's in America, a couple European countries, a couple South American countries, and uh, it's only a 5K course, okay, so 3.1 miles, not very ultra endurance, but definitely challenging with the obstacles built in. The fundraiser is for the St. Jude Ch Children's Research Hospital, and their motto is anyone can start, but everyone can finish. Okay, everyone can finish this race based on their ideas and practices that everyone at that race will be helping you. Everyone at that race will be helping you get through this course. Once again, these integrated obstacles are shown here in our video for the Warrior Dash, the course in action. There are two big events is the Warrior Wall, or the Great Warrior Wall as they call it, which isn't shown here, but it's a 14-foot wall that you have to climb up, and then once again, you're jumping off in hopes that uh, you land in pretty deep water. And they have uh, another ropes obstacle, which you climb across, which is about 10 to 12 feet high as well. And then you actually slide down a water slide, just like you're a kid again into water, which is pretty fun. So you see them running over the high fire. It's a great course. Now one of my personal favorites, the Ragnar Relay, which actually started in Utah in 2004. It's the largest overnight race in the United States. So these teams are running around for about 36 hours uh, consistently, constantly. They're not, they're not stopping. 200-mile course. Fundraiser goes to the Child Abuse Prevention Center. And their motto is, go the extra mile for humanity. So all these funds go to help build awareness to uh, child abuse and abuse in general, actually. And the course is split between teams of 6 or 12. So you have ultra teams, which are six individuals, and these individuals are going to be running anywhere from 20 to 30 miles within that 36-hour period. And the teams of 12 will have individuals running as low as 10 miles per hour in the 36-hour period to as high as about 26.2 miles, which is a marathon. Now here's our overnight course. This is actually the, the Beach Cities course, which runs from Huntington Beach, California, down to San Diego. And you'll see they run across from the beach inland to the... Uh, about South Orange County area, all the way down to North San Diego County. And they have these slat wristbands that you hand off to your teammates at the end of each leg. And the way your teammates get to you is in a van of about six people where they're dropping off and picking up consistently throughout this 36 hour period. So you actually see people will decorate their vans based on their theme of their team. And it's really cool to meet all the people that are doing this and very excited about it. Our last obstacle course race we'll talk about is the Spartan race. So once again, this is another worldwide, a worldwide based uh, race, and they base it off different Spartan levels, anywhere from three miles to actually 26.2. So they have Spartan sprints, Spartan beast, and they call it an ultra Spartan, which is our 26.2 mile course. Fundraisers for the 431 Project, which is their own personal nonprofit project that helps create awareness of childhood obesity. So we're, they're really trying to get people aware of the benefits of exercising at a, starting at a young age and not waiting until it's too, uh, the, the diseases have progressed. And they call Spartan more than just a race, okay? Because they're really, once again, this idea of building camaraderie, working as a team and not worrying about how fast you finish, but that everyone around you is finishing as well. And the integrated obstacles are shown here. As you can see, an amputee actually taking part in the, the event itself. You have the high ropes course, if you remember back. I, don't, I never had this as a uh, physical education student, but I know a lot of uh, older individuals had the high rope that you had to climb up and ring the bell. 
the mud under the, <clears throat> the mud in the water, staying under the barbed wire. As you can see, that is real barbed wire that they're trying to stay under there as they're climbing through the mud. <laughs> And uh, we have a couple of honorable mentions here. So the Catalina Classic Paddle, here's a little bit of my West Coast bias coming out. But uh, this is a 32-mile paddle race from Hermosa Beach, California, to Catalina Island. Now, 32 miles on a paddleboard is extremely long when you're out in the middle of the sun, the middle of the ocean. You have salt water all around you, and you're exhausted. But you make it all the way there. A lot of these guys, great athletes. Then we have our Leadville 100 mile run, which is a 50 mile run out in Leadville, Colorado, and has elevation changes as high as 12,500 feet. So if you've ever done any kind of endurance sport at elevation, you know how hard this type of running would be. So they go 50 miles out and 50 miles back in Leadville, Colorado. And the last two we'll talk about, the race across America, putting in for our cyclist here. So it's a 3,000 mile race from Annapolis, Maryland to Oceanside, California with elevation changes as high as 170,000 feet. So of course you're going across those Colorado Rockies, right? You have to get across the Colorado Rockies and you'll have climbs that are just ridiculous for some of these riders and they get through it. These 3,000 miles, they get through it all. And the last we'll talk about the annual Avalon Benefit, which is a Catalina Island run. 50 miles around the island, and the buffalo is their main uh, uh, insignia there, as you can see, because there are wild buffalo on the island that you'll run around and see, which is a pretty cool uh, thing to experience while you're running around. And, of course, a bunch of series, serious major heel changes as you're going through the, the course. All right, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Kravitz and uh, let you guys enjoy the panel. How about a round of applause for Tony? He did a fabulous job. Which one would you like to sign up for? You don't get out tonight unless you sign up for one of those events. <laughs> the pressure's on. The president of the conference, Mike Spazano, is here. Everyone, do you see Mike over there? He's turning a little bit red. One, two, three, one loud clap for Mike. He's done an incredible job. One, two, three. <laughs> Yay! You're awesome. You are awesome. Okay, <laughs> let's do it right now. Not, let's do it right, okay, you got it, okay. All right, we're gonna start with a question for our esteemed panelists, Dr. Levin, Brubin, and Dr. Stanforth, and I believe we're gonna go with you, Dr. Blevin, first. Um, as a medical doctor, I'd like you just to share w with us any clinical concerns that you see with ultra endurance? Thanks, son. Good evening, everybody. So I didn't realize, but I'm actually a, an ultra athlete. Uh, my son, uh, my gosh, how old was Jackson? He was probably 14 at the time, so we did a Spartan race. So I don't have any concerns. Uh, it's really the truth. Uh, you know, I would love to have slides, but I don't. Uh, there is no, so for everybody, there is no good evidence that these types of races or other uh, ultra endurance events are any different from a physician's standpoint than sports in general, okay? Other like, you know, for instance, a half marathon, a full marathon. So to me, I don't really have this in a special category. If you look in the literature, there is one injury or one condition that's described in ultra marathoners, and that's uh, dorsiflexion uh, tendinosis. So maybe a special category of medial tibial stress syndrome, okay? But that's it, and that's not really that bad, right? Now, since uh, Len called me up here, and he told me I gotta talk more than 10 seconds. What I'll, what I'll do is I'll give you just sort of a very brief overview of the things that I do worry about in general, okay? So here's my notes. See how long this is gonna take? This is, this is it. So in general, um, you know, I worry a little bit about uh, mental health, okay? Uh, not so much for these ones. These are fun and mud runs are fun. I mean, that's probably great. But if you're really out there doing ultra marathons and ultra events, you know, you're burning up to 10,000 calories a day. That's a lot of calories. And so who does that, right? <laughs> and, and so I would worry about, you know, is there some sort of uh, eating disorder involved? You know, there are variants uh, where, uh, you know, you're purging by exercising more and more. So that is in... Uh, in the medical literature, if you will. So I worried a little bit about that. And then, of course, the other thing is, is just overuse, right? 
So uh, a lot of folks that uh, decide, hey, I, you know, I'm uh, whatever point in my life, uh, for instance, uh, I'll use my own sister. She never did anything in her life athletic, nothing. When she turned 50, she decided she's gonna run a marathon. And uh, so she started training and of course got a stress fracture uh, and uh, you know, uh, calls me. You know, fortunately, it's easy to diagnose those, right? It hurts, you know, so it's easy to do. But she, she did eventually, she got better and ran her marathon. So, you know, she did just fine. And then of course in endurance events, you always worry about, you know, heat injuries, uh, cold injuries, um, you know, hyponatremia. Actually, I've seen more uh, problems with hyponatremia than dehydration. So keep that in mind uh, when you're out there talking to your folks. And I think that that's really, I mean, let me see what else I didn't, I didn't hit here. Oh, all right, so I, the question was hyponatremia. So, uh, you see, so I do see this. I see this in, uh, so I'm a Navy doc. I see it in you know, overnight events where Marines are out all night and they have things they have to do where they're simulating battle or they're in battle and they drink and they drink and they drink and they drink and they keep drinking because some sergeant's telling them keep drinking. Well, you can drink too much water, okay, and it's actually deadly. And uh, when I think back on my coverage of uh, a couple of marathons, uh, I haven't seen any heat injury deaths, but I've seen a hyponatremia death. So I always worry about that. And so the key there, and I'll just tell you, and, and I can't remember if Noakes is the guy who published this, uh, but hydration is very controversial. And so I'm gonna encourage you to read the ACSM's position stand on hydration. They actually just put out a brand new March 2016 position stand on nutrition uh, with hydration in it, so uh, please do that. But for me, I tell everybody, hey, drink to thirst, okay? Uh, I think that's the safest way, and uh, it doesn't hurt performance. You're about 2% dehydrated if you do that, if you wait until you're thirsty, but that's not dangerous. So that's my favorite way to say it. Um, if you're real scientific about it, you can weigh yourself, train to it, know exactly what you need to drink, you know what I mean? So you, you can go about that. And I think I'll stop there and wait for more questions. So while Lynn changes out the slides, because I'm sorry, I'm a teacher, I do have some slides for you. Why don't you stand up, 10 squats, and think about which of those events would you like to do? And I'd like to see hands up if any of you have ever done one of these ultra endurance events as you're doing your squats, because if you've done them, you can do squats and lift your hand up in the air. Okay. And so those of you who aren't, you're just here kind of interested in learning more about this? Is that the deal? Okay, awesome. Is that my advance? Sometimes you have to press it a couple times. Okay, I will work on it. Good, you guys are just so great. You did your squats, you did them all, then you sat down, thank you. Okay, well my question is about the effect, the cognitive effects of ultra endurance events. And so when you, Think about what's happening with the brain. This is actually, the, these are MRI scans from the Trans Europe foot race. And I'm gonna talk about that particular study in just a few minutes. But how many of you have been to some of the sessions here that have talked about the benefits of physical activity on cognition? Yeah, I mean, this is part of our message, right? And it's all the way through, is there a little pointer line or anything? Is there like a lasery thing? That's, oh, there it is, there, no, I saw it on the ceiling. Ah, there it is, but you know what? It goes away when it goes to the screen. So, through the age span, from children to older adults, regular physical activity has positive beneficial effects on the brain. And when you think about how it works, there's this really nice meta-analysis out there that has taken data from prospective studies with over 30,000 people when you combine all of those studies together. And what all of these studies say collectively, because they said it individually, but collectively a little bit more powerfully, is that there are protective effects of physical activity on the brain, and they're not really dose dependent. There's not much difference between high intensity, or, I mean high amounts of exercise, and low to moderate self-reported activity levels. Sorry, that was a slip there. Not intensity, but the volume of training, how much training they're doing. And they also showed that the effects may be a little bit stronger in women compared to men. 
So physical activity across the spectrum of ages and across the spectrum of dose all has a positive beneficial effect potentially and it affects cognitive function in a number of different ways. And these are some of the ways that these different studies were able to show. How does it work? What's going on? And you see everything from improved blood flow and oxygen utilization in the brain to just a simple decrease in cardiovascular risk factors and reducing the risk of some type of cerebrovascular incident. And then there are these neurotrophic effects where you, if you went to any of the, the cognition sessions, you learned all about what's happening at in, in, in producing better synaptic responses and making the dendrites actually grow and function better so that anatomically the brain works better. And we're going to talk a little bit more about these neurotrophins in just a minute. And then lastly, the effect on cortisol levels. And so when you look at the response to stress that just comes as a normal part of our lives, physical activity can have a positive effect on what's happening with your cortisol levels, which will affect your cognitive function as well. So well, that's all from this meta-analytic uh, paper. I came across this review article, and I was somewhat encouraged to read that this what they called these cellular and molecular cascades, these strings of events that are happening in the cardiovascular system, in the immune response, what's happening with the, directly within the anatomy of the brain, that it's not really well understood yet. So we don't really understand the mechanisms fully, but most of the studies point to these four areas as being key. So you're looking at those cardiovascular effects, the immunological effects, so um, oftentimes related to inflammation, and then neuroendocrine and neurotrophic effects. So when we summarize that, when you look at what they're talking about, we look at improved cardiac and immune function, which is going to help with areas in the brain where we talk about that improved blood flow and oxygenation to the brain, your brain is, sim in simple terms, it's going to work better. And then these anti-inflammatory effects. We're learning that inflammation underlies most disease processes, regardless of what the disease condition is, that there is an inflammatory process involved there. And so sustained exercise can actually be helpful with that. And when we look at this brain-derived neurotrophic factor, how many of you have heard BDNF? If you've been here in any of the sessions this week, you've certainly heard it, where you're looking at BDNF being synthesized at a higher rate associated with exercise. And then, as these authors described it, they say that BDNF is critically important to both the cellular and the subcellular mechanisms that are associated with both learning and with memory, and it is a very reliable biomarker for impaired memory in humans. So BDNF is one that we're all going to be reading more about in the years to come, and as scientists understand better how these different trophic factors work. BDNF appears to be one of the main players in terms of how your brain functions, and it is associated with exercise. So the bottom line from both the meta-analysis and the review article was simple. Moderate endurance exercise improves cognition and can protect against the degeneration that happens in the brain with aging. But notice that what they're talking about there is moderate amounts of endurance exercise. Because we see headlines like this all the time, right? So you, you see these headlines and you think, exercise too much? What are they talking about? How could exercise be bad for us? This is our life. This is what we do. And I found it so helpful that this review article, which I would commend to you, it's, it's fairly recent, very well written, and I'm going to read this quote. I don't typically read full quotes, but they had an entire section in this review article on extreme endurance exercise because all of the positive stuff that's associated with regular, moderate endurance exercise kind of goes out the window with extreme endurance exercise in terms of how it affects the brain. So here's what they said. 
Despite the positive effects of moderate physical activity on the brain, a number of studies have li linked extreme exercise to a disruption of cellular, metabolic, and hormonal processes, and in turn, to adverse neurological sequelae and cognitive dysfunction. Things aren't working positively, but may be going in the opposite direction. And in this paper, they review the cellular mechanisms by which extreme physical activity might actually interfere with normal neuronal function, particularly those involved with learning and memory. So we have to make a distinction when we're talking about the benefits of exercise on the brain. What kind of exercise are we talking about? particularly in terms of volume of exercise, there appears to be a difference. And so in this review article, they talk about the effects of extreme physical activity on the brain, and they show that these are kind of the, the two main things that so far the research has uncovered. First is increased oxidative stress, and they have shown that that increased stress in both rats and in humans can actually cause damage to tissue and it can weaken the immune system. And so you have one of these hormonal cascades that rolls out of that, that they really don't understand all the implications of it, and yet we know that the outcome is not positive, but has the potential to be negative. The second key factor was an increase in corticosteroid signaling. And how many of you familiar with cortisol? Yes, so cortisol is a stress hormone. And what in the fitness industry do most of us, when we think about elevated cortisol levels, what is it that people are talking about? Belly fat, for the most part, right? They're talking about the, the increased likelihood of laying down visceral fat. And yet here what they're showing is that these elevated levels of cortisol have a negative effect on cognitive function as well. So it goes beyond what's happening in terms of body composition to the function of your brain. So when you think about these extreme events, I'm, I actually looked at beyond things like Tough Mudder to some of these amazing events that people do. And this had caught my eye a while ago because you start seeing things that talk about ultramarathon shrinking your brain, it gets your attention. You're <laughs> thinking, what is happening here? Did anybody see this? It was in the popular press. It kind of hit um, big time throughout the, the popular press for a while there. And it was based on this research paper that was published on the Trans-Europe foot race. And the Trans-Europe foot race is a 4,487 kilometer ultramarathon over 400 miles is what they're covering. And they evaluated these runners by taking MRIs of their brains before, during, and after. And what caught the headline attention was the fact that they found a 6% decrease in gray matter volume and in body weight. It was interesting that there was a parallel between body weight loss and loss of gray matter. But note, they returned to baseline eight months after the race. So it was a transient effect. It wasn't something that stayed with them. And importantly, they did not find that the um, athletes developed any new brain lesions during the race. Because this research was actually linked to what Steve mentioned in terms of hyponatremia. And with hyponatremia in even just the marathon distance, one of the concerns is what is happening to the brain with hyponatremia and the development in a single marathon of having damage to the gray matter of the brain. That's what actually triggered them following these people over a much longer um, race course. So what they found, bottom line, this 6% um, loss in two months of running, it was substantial, but as I said, it was transient. It went away. And the comparison in the headlines, though, were to the fact that we do lose brain volume as we age, but it's less than 0.2% per year as you get older. It's at a much slower rate than during these types of levels of ultra-endurance events. The author speculated as to possible mechanisms, and they came down really heavy on the side of hyponatremia, potentially being one of the big players. They also mentioned the role of cortisol. So ex um, heightened levels of cortisol for extended periods of time. 
And then there was some issue about protein balance. So again, the mechanisms aren't clear, but they concluded that despite the, what they called the massive metabolic load that these athletes lived under for two months, they didn't develop any long-term lesions in the brain and their matter went back to normal or baseline values within a period of months following the race. Yes. Was Thank there you. any report on, on the practical effects of this, of these find, of these particular changes, like their functioning? And okay, so like that? the question about were there other implications? They actually didn't look at that. I'm expecting to see more research coming out because when you follow people for two months, you do a lot of testing on them, and my guess is that they just haven't made it through the peer review process to have that get out there yet. My guess is we're going to learn more um, about some of those other issues, and I have another race that has published data on that that we're going to talk about in just a second. So there's your bottom line for that. How many of you have seen this sign somewhere? Yeah, yeah, hands going up. It's, you know, we kind of ha ha ha, while you were sleeping, I was running. Well, with these ultra endurance athletes, they're sleeping while they're running because <laughs> they are running for hours and hours and hours, 24, 36, 48 hours. And in the military, I think you see even more extended durations. So there are some interesting studies that look at what are some of these other effects, not just what's happening to the gray matter of your brain, but when you look at what is the effect of sleep deprivation with these races? Have you been sitting there wondering that? How do you do these races and exercise for 36 hours? So there's a, a nice paper on this um, North Face race that was it's 104 miles, and it's in the mountains, so it's at altitude. And they followed these racers through, through this ultra marathon. They had them wear actographs, a little more high end from what I can understand than what you get in your uh, Fitbit surge because it's, it's trying to assess micro sleep cycles. So they're trying to see are people running and having s moments of micro sleeping as opposed to, they're not talking about the 12 to 17 minutes laying down on the ground for 17 minutes and sleeping. They're talking about micro cycles of sleep while they are running. And what they found after looking at them pre and post race was that despite having only 12 to 17 minutes on average of sleep during the race, 104 miles, that the adverse effects were highly variable. There were some adverse effects but they were really different from one person to the next. So one person simply, their response times on some of the, the motor testing wasn't all that great, and other people were hallucinating and seeing monkeys jumping out of trees. It, it was highly variable. So they concluded that the cognitive lapses weren't just attributed to not getting enough sleep, but there's just, extreme physical demands associated with these kinds of races. So there's some other physical mechanisms going on, not just the cognitive impact of sleep deprivation, and that there's huge amounts of individual variability. How each one of us might respond to an event like that is going to be very, very different, but their conclusion was that it can be unsafe because of things as simple as a loss of balance when you're on some of those trails that they're trying to navigate and you haven't slept in 25 hours and you go sliding down the mountain, high risk of injury, not just an overuse type of injury, but one that's associated with impairment. And then, as I mentioned, the, the real concerns in terms of severe injury through hallucination or a more significant cognitive event. So we see headlines like this, and it, it does, it gets your attention, right? And yet now you know that there's the headline, 6% of their brain lost during an ultramarathon, but you have to dig in to find out that it all came back. <laughs> it did come back and there wasn't any apparent long-term damage to them. So we have to continue to investigate. And I'm thinking, you know, keep calm. The research is still, it, it's not definitive yet. And if you think in terms of the ultra-endurance world, 
it's only halfway and that means you still have 60 or 80 miles to go. <laughs> so there's still a lot of miles in front of you. So I'll wrap up this little section here, just kind of where's the future of this going? And I think it ties in with the message we've heard over and over at the summit this year, is this concept of the need to have individualized plans for people. Not everybody wants to do an ultra endurance event. Not everybody um, has the genetic capacity to do it, I don't think. And yet this ability to individualize plans for people is where we're headed with this group of athletes. And if you've never checked out Training Peaks, it's a great site. They do some amazing stuff in helping athletes create individualized plans. And I'll just summarize it's a very complicated um, formula that they use, but in simple terms, they actually give their athletes a score. And they tell their athletes, if you score plus 30, you're probably losing fitness, and you're at minus 30, you're compromising your immune system. There's a sweet spot in between plus and minus 30 that you need to be training at. And they calculate that through looking at people's power outputs and the amount of work that they're doing. And so they, they have a formula for using this chronic, what they call chronic training load, which is the average of those scores over the previous 45 days. And then they look at what they call the acute training load, which is your average over the last seven days. And then you take your chronic minus your average, and that gives you this chronic stress balance score. And they try to get their athletes to train within, away from the plus or the minus 30, but to train at the sweet spot for that athlete. So when you think about the um, average exerciser, they're not measuring power outputs. They're not going to be interested in this. But this is where the field of ultra endurance is heading because they have to be able to make sure that they can train in a way that they're not compromising their immune system and setting themselves up for injury or sickness, and they have to make sure that they're training enough to continue to see improvement. And then in terms of the hydration issue, um, I was fortunate enough, um, Austin, Texas hosts something called the South by Southwest Interactive, and it's a digital, the first five days of the, this big conference is all um, new technology, and I was able to be a part of that um, a few weeks back. And even in the, the field of hydration, you're going to individualized bottles. And inside the caps, you have sensors, and you are measuring what people are drinking. And they have this set up where a, a coach has a pad, and it's so their iPad. And what they have on there is every athlete, and they know what they're drinking, and they have a specialized mixture of what they're getting in their bottle. This is where we're headed. With this level of athlete, this is the kind of stuff that you're talking about for the future. So I'm going to wrap up there, Lynn. And we're going to take questions. Take questions. OK, it's your turn. What questions do you have? Tony's going to go to you so we can hear it on the mic. So let's start. Who would like to start? OK, so we've got one question in the back. Go ahead, Tony. Her one question in the back. And, and you get that mic. Can you hold this one? Thank you very much. I remember it was a couple, several years ago, maybe five to seven years ago, it was either a national meeting or a summit, but there was a whole symposium on exercise and immunology and uh, ultra, ultra long distance events, and they talked about adversely affecting T cells, and even uh, I think that David Neiman was talking at, at one point, and even in, in an article in Health and Fitness Journal about the uh, exercise and, I'm sorry, cancer being caused by ultra endurance events. So it seems to be a lot of, uh, it seems to be a lot out there about the, you know, whether I, upper respiratory and tract infections to, yeah, you know, there's a lot of David negative things. David Neiman has done some amazing work on the, the role of marathon distance and beyond, the ability to suppress the immune system response. And I think he's shown it mainly in the upper respiratory, the URTIs, so looking at infections in the upper respiratory system. But when you start looking more at the cellular level and those inflammatory processes and the immune response, um, it appears to be potentially problematic. 
Yeah, and I'll add to that. You know, that's not just ultra endurance. That's uh, extreme yeah. intensity. So, you know, if you're going above and beyond what you're normally trained to do, you are going to compromise your immune system. So, you need to know that, uh, and that it applies not, like I said, not just ultra endurance, but anytime you're over intense in uh, in what you're doing, you'll you will drive your immune system down. And I'm convinced that that's part of where groups like the Training Peaks, that's where they're coming from, is if you, if you want to be able to keep training, you've got to have a way to quantify that mm -hmm. and to know what is going to be most optimal for me. And it can be challenging balance to find that. I mean, I, I, was, I was thinking just like, you know, we, we think of exercise as medicine, but everyone would look at medicine and say that, you know, there's, there's a certain optimal dose and we all pretty much agree on that there is a underdose and you're not getting a sufficient uh, right. effect and then there's overdosing and having a deleterious effect so it, it seems like exercise is probably something like that yeah and I think that you know when we're looking at, at exercise we're thinking about um, again I come back to the, the need to individualize it for people you, you have to to think about the individual and what is potentially appropriate for them because with medicine we know that there's responders and non-responders to most medications, right? So how many of you find that Advil works really great, but Tylenol doesn't? I mean, we, we tend to think that there's a single prescription that always works and that this dose is good for everybody, but responders and non-responders and different people respond differently to the same dosage. And so I think that we are really headed in that direction, um, not just with the ultras, but potentially looking bigger picture at, at pretty much anybody. But I'll let the medical doctor yeah, chime in on that. Yeah, let me comment on that uh, specifically. How many of you have uh, either yourselves or your clients or your patients uh, keep a logbook? Okay, well, all yeah. pro athletes keep logbooks. Yeah. <laughs> why? Why? Do you know why? What's that? Okay, so that's absolutely right for one piece they, to track progress because I want to see, hey, I want to keep you know, getting better and increasing that 10% a week so I remember what I did last week and I can go. The other, one of the other reasons, there's many reasons, one of the other reasons to keep a logbook is because all of a sudden, if you start declining and you don't sleep very well and all of a sudden you're depressed for a couple of weeks, right? What's going on? There's a syndrome. What's it called? Overtraining syndrome. And that's exactly why they keep logbooks, okay? Because it's a fine line between doing your absolute best, right? Getting better all the time and getting worse. I mean, that's a very fine line. That's why you have to have a coach, uh, you know, a good coach, right? Not just, hey, work harder, work harder, work harder. And so that's what uh, is coming in to play, I think, with, you know, when you see these deleterious effects of ultra events, it's, it's, it's the same, you know, immune systems, they get more infections. So. Yep. And I'm going to chime in there. How many of you use resting heart rate as your early warning indicator light, right? Resting heart rate is probably the easiest yep. tool that, uh, you know, at Texas, I don't know if you guys know, just won the NC2A swimming. Mm -hmm. And those athletes are about the most overtrained athletes on the planet. Eddie Reese is a brilliant coach, but those kids, I mean, they live overtrained, but they live and die by their resting heart rate. And they make sure that when that resting heart rate starts to go up the tiniest little drift, that they, get, they back, it, back it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good, you know, I just call it an, like, like your check engine light. It, it's telling you, you need to pay attention because something's going on. And that, that little drift in your resting heart rate is telling you that you're not getting rest even though you're resting and your immune system is running in overdrive, whether it means you've been exposed to the virus from the kids sitting next to you or because it's overtraining. Who cares what the cause is? You need to back off so that your immune system can strengthen and rebuild. Yep. Well, I just, uh, I, I've done uh, Paris Press Paris four times. And so it, it, it happens every four years. And the first time I did it, it was 38 years old. And I used a heart rate monitor, but the testosterone or being a young male kind of beat me up, but I'm sure I lost 6% of my brain mass in that. 
<laughs> if but, not more. But it was one of the most <laughs> enjoyable things, and it reset my life wow. on on trying to do training where I didn't overdo. Yeah. And uh, so this last year I did it again, and so it's every four years. Um, and of course I used a power meter, and uh, and of course I used all those things because when you as you get older. Why wouldn't you use all the tools that are available? Because yeah. the only way you can overcome this young drive is to be smarter than them and have better feedback. And you look great for 28. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> so train smarter. Train smarter. Train and smarter. and I, I just wanted to say the power meters and what's going on there yeah. is, is so huge that um, it, it's changing everything if you want to learn about it. It is, and it's out there. Lynn, did you want to say thank Yes, thank you. Do you want, would you like to, could you, she has a question in the back. While he's getting that back there, would you describe your event? Because I, I don't know that everybody's familiar with it. Well, uh, when I did it in 1991, the first right. time, uh, it was the 100 year anniversary. So it's everything that, the history that you gave. And so I felt kind of wimpy that, you know, that, uh, that I was doing with all this good technology. But the basic way I do it is I try to take care of myself and sleep. So the, so the, yeah, right, so, so the, so the first day I ride 275 miles and then I, I rest and then I ride to Brest, which is 100 miles, and then back to Ludiac. So the second day I do 200 miles and then the third day I just ride back 275 miles. A lot of miles. Wow. Yes. That's amazing. Just 275. <laughs> Woohoo! Let's hear it. That's amazing. <laughs> you sleep three nights. There you go. Smart man. Okay. Hi there. Um, I heard you talk a lot about cognitive functioning, um, how the brain reacts to ultra endurance. Um, but one thing that I've been looking more into is the cardiac response. And of course, even here at the conference, we've heard, you know, the left ventricle, it enlarges during exercise, we know that. And it looks good in those who exercise, but not good in those who are sedentary. However, I've been doing even more research looking into it because I have heart disease on both sides of my family. Plus, I'm an educator and a fitness instructor. Um, and I just ran a half marathon. Good for you. But, but my concern was, what does this stress, these oxidative stresses, do to our heart in the long term? And I came across some, some research that was showing that in autopsies of marathoners, it actually showed similar damage to the heart and aging of the cardiac muscle as in those with advanced cardiova cardiovascular disease. So I think that's also a concern, and I'm just curious what your take on that is because you know there is that fine line but p these people think you know they're doing what's right for them but we see they're losing gray matter and maybe it comes back after you know six or eight months after ba you know back to baseline but really long term is it gonna pred predisposition them to early onset alzheimer's you know what kind of research has been done with that too so it's just, where do you really, you know, address that and draw the line for health versus, you know, too much extreme? Yes, good. Steve, you go first. You sure you don't want to go first? No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's a great uh, question. I'm going to summarize uh, the part that I, that I think I'm going to answer, and that is, in, uh, how does exercise relate to cardiac disease, really? And so what I'm going to answer that with is, if you read the ACSM position statements on exercise and, and sort of cardiac screening, okay, there's a couple of things you should take away. One is exercise kills people, okay, there's no doubt about it. If you have heart disease uh, and you go out and you overexert, you are likely to have a heart attack and die. You need to know that, okay. It does cause more cardiac deaths, okay. Now in population health, you got to weigh that. Okay, well, exercise also prevents cardiac death, doesn't it? And the answer is yes, it does. Okay, so it gets back sort of to the indiv individual. And so what you really need to do uh, if you're starting on your exercise program that you've never done before, you need to be assessed, okay? You need to go talk to your doctor and you need to let them know, hey, this is my family history, this is my history, 
and I'm getting ready to start a new exercise program, and I'm actually thinking about very high intense uh, exertion level. Because you come to me and say, hey, look, I'm going to start walking. I'm going to say, good for you. Walk. If you got any chest pain, stop. Because I'm going to let you do that. But if you're like, hey, look, I'm going to go, I'm going to go start running, and I'm going to be sprinting, and I'm, I'm going to be out there really at uh, the maximum amount my heart will let me do, and you're of a certain age, and you've got a certain history, I'm going to worry more about you. And I may, I may get an EKG. I may get an ultrasound, uh, depending on what you tell me, right? I may put you on a treadmill, depending on what you tell me. Uh, so that is really what you have to take away from this. Exercise kills people. Absolutely. We know that. That's why we worry about it in the medical field, and that's why we have screening uh, questionnaires uh, and things like that. The other thing you need to take away is exercise is great for probably the vast majority of people uh, in terms of quantity and quality of life. And that's why we always say exercise is a good thing, knowing that always is never correct and never is another word that you never say, right? <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I hope it does. Well, and to kind of piggyback on that just a little bit, because as I was preparing, Len had asked me to prepare the cognitive piece, and I came across a number of those articles that you're referring to, and it's relatively new findings in terms of these autopsies of highly fit people and some of the loss of elasticity that appears, so fibrotic changes in the heart tissue, and certainly some size changes, whether that's beneficial or not, it's hard to determine after death, and so I don't know that that question has been answered yet. But I think that it has raised that question in terms of the highly trained population and what might be some of those longer term potentially negative changes for the heart. It's very new data as far as I could tell. I've, I only saw things that were, that were very recent and they were more case study and saying, oh my goodness, look at this, this highly trained athlete and this, is, this was the condition of their heart. And so then you start thinking a little bit about you all may be too young for the Jim Fix syndrome. You know, when Jim mm -hmm. Fix, you know, the famous marathoner, I, I have clients who still bring his name up just to get out of running. Don't you remember that Jim Fix guy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, so I, it gets back to what we've all said. Oh, yeah, so Jim Fix, mar a marathoner, and died a heart attack. while running <laughs> from a heart attack. And so, you know, it becomes problematic. Our message <laughs> becomes challenging, and that, that's where Steve can say exercise can kill you, but a lot of it does come back to individual differences. I would say with what sounds like your genetic profile, I would be a little more aggressive in terms of some of the baseline testing to try to get some better information because you have family history on both sides. Jack Wilmore, um, who was my mentor through graduate school, he used to say when, when I was first learning about risk factors, and he would always say, you know, ACSM and everybody else says that family history is not a primary risk factor. Well, if it's your family history, it sure feels like a primary risk factor. So I think you weight it a little bit differently and respond you know, accordingly, um, knowing that, that you have potentially greater risk than perhaps other people in the room. So good for you for finding that stuff. Hi, um, I actually was commenting about, in response to two of those uh, comments, but um, I grew up in a very fit family. Both my parents had run uh, about five marathons, and wow. my um, mom died a few years ago of lung cancer, never smoked in her life, and uh, they were kind of baffled. Uh, she was healthy, no medications, very healthy runner, and um, I started researching stuff and started finding, you know, with endurance events, uh -huh. the decrease in um, circulating, uh, I have a brain block, um, antioxidants. And uh, so, you know, I wondered, I guess in marathon doesn't have to be ultra uh, events that happen. And then on the cardiac standpoint, then the rest of us were triathletes and um, up until about 10 years ago when I had to stop running, every time I'd do a triathlon, I would have like palpitations. Mm -hmm. So I'm a nurse and I would drive into the hospital, put myself on the monitor <laughs> and found that I was, uh, every time was in second degree heart block. 
went to a cardiologist, was put on a Holter monitor for a week, never had any cardiac incidences during the week when I wasn't, but after a race, that would happen. I, I don't know if that would be electrolyte deficiencies versus what? Yeah, so second degree heart block, I'm assuming you had the good one, because one's good and one's bad. <laughs> And it is described in athletes, and I don't think we really understand why, but it is. I mean, it's, you know, I, w I won't say it's common, but it is reported, so it's not uncommon. And as long as you've got, uh, I can't remember which one it is, it's type one probably, where, yeah, the Winky Bach, that's, that's a benign, yeah. you, know, uh, it's, you know, like athletes get first degree heart block also, it's benign. As long as it's not, you know, third degree or, you know, second degree type two, I think uh, you won't need a pacemaker. Here you go. Oh, you got her. When you mentioned a moment ago about intensity of training, could you address rhabdomyolysis concerns with that? And didn't the military, the Army, I, I read several studies that the Army attempted to possibly bring in a program, I'm almost hesitant to say the name here, but CrossFit, and, and, and that they de declined moving forward with it. Can you address that? Yeah, I can. It's actually one of my favorite uh, topics. <laughs> so, uh, one of the one of the um, potential uh, this is actually part of the talk we gave last year. It is. One of the potential problems with high intensity uh, events, you know, muscular events uh, such as pyramid programs. This is what I've seen most problems. I got a lot of I take care of a lot of Marines, and uh, there's things they'll do like uh, you know, 20 pull-ups, 20 push-ups. You know. 10 pull-ups, 10 push-ups, and you end up doing like a bazillion push-ups and a bazillion pull-ups, and they come into my uh, smart clinic, sports medicine clinic, on the fourth day, and they can't extend their arm and because it, re it really hurts. And uh, I think I said yesterday, if you were here my talk yesterday, I missed the first one of those. I said, well, you know, I don't know. I think it's just, you know, you're just a little bit sore. You're four days out. You've lived. You'll be fine. But come back tomorrow if it doesn't get better. So they came back, and it was not any better, and this side was now involved. So I got a CK. So the definition of rhabdomyolysis for most people is uh, creatinine kinase level greater than five times normal. Normal is like 200. I'm telling you, 1,000 is a nothing. High school football players come up to 3,000, so I don't buy that diagnosis. But I do buy 180,000, okay? And these guys were 180,000. So uh, it is potentially uh, dangerous um, uh, to do these sorts of things that you're not trained to do. And so they weren't doing a CrossFit routine, but they were doing something like a CrossFit routine, and they were not trained in that. Because what happened is, you know, one of the people was, hey, let's go do this, because that was his thing. Well, he was fine. It's the other five people that had never done it. They're strong enough to do it today, right? You can go out and do it, because you're strong enough. The problem is you never trained for that, and you tore a whole bunch of muscle, and, you know, too much muscle. That's how you get stronger, right? You tear some, but they, don't, they just tore too much. So it is a concern, uh, rhabdomyolysis is a concern, and also with heat injuries, okay, they often coincide. One thing. And, you know, from the, the summary standpoint, I think for me, because I know Lynn is going to be wrapping up here, whenever you think about a continuum, usually the extreme ends are not a good place to be, right? And so we worry about the sedentary people who do nothing, and now we're talking about the people who are way over here on this end, and yet all the good stuff happens a lot of times in here. So I think from a continuum perspective, there are going to be problems with sedentary, being too sedentary, and there's going to be problems with being too physically active. And it, it just it's really does make sense. But understanding it a little bit can be helpful. That's awesome. You two are awesome. <laughs> they, awesome. They, they are awesome. <laughs> my, 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 my best. One of my best mentors in teaching, uh, Dr. Bill Gustafson said, Len, when you present, always leave your audience wanting more. Mm -hmm. So this is the perfect time. Everybody yeah. just ready, but we're out of time. If you have a one-on-one -on -one question, come on up, but I'll see you all tomorrow. Oh. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Yes, fabulous. <laughs>